The 1990s and early 2000s were a really weird era in history for a special reason. It was the first era in history in which there was only one world power. For all of history, various factions struggled life and death over often tiny parts of the world while the larger empires were lucky to even conquer the majority of one continent. However, through the world wars, the number of great powers dwindled from somewhere beneath 10 before World War I to after the fall of the Soviet Union there just being one left, the United States of America. From the fall of the Soviet Union until the 2008 financial crisis, the U.S. was the preeminent military power. No one before or since was able to wield as much technological, military, economic, political, and cultural power as the U.S. was in those years. However, due to a combination of idiotic American leadership as its nature abhors a vacuum, this unipolar world system ended. We're currently in a bipolar world system. There are two main powers in the whole world, China and the United States. Both of these nations maintain vast coalitions of lesser powers that they support. However, even this world system is becoming more transitory. We're currently seeing the process of the world becoming multipolar. If current trajectories continue, we'll see a return of the old world, where all sorts of regional powers competed with each other. This video is going to go through the list of countries that I think will become major powers. It's ordered by which countries I think are most plausible for being regional political powers. China doesn't get onto this list since it basically deserves a future video in of itself. With that out of the way, let's start. Before we start, this video is sponsored by the I Overlord series by Josh Dunn. This is a really good fantasy series at a tech nerd who gets sucked into a fantasy dimension where he's given immense magical powers. He then uses this as a platform to fight the evil theocracy that controls the continent. He has lots of crazy adventures with his giant sentient tower he pulls power from, and also his talking Labrador dog. I really enjoyed this book on practically every level. The characters were realistic and likable, something you rarely see in fantasy or sci-fi. I also really liked how Josh's writing is fast-paced and there are all sorts of comedy tidbits thrown in, so you're never bored. An issue I run into with a lot of fantasy books I read as a history buff is that most fantasy societies just don't work. That's not the case here. Everything works and there's a well-crafted magic system. Josh and I are currently in a royalty sharing deal, so by clicking the link in the description and buying the book, you're supporting me directly. Josh and I are giving away some Tower Lords t-shirts. We'll pick a handful of winners from people who tweet at me or Josh Dunn with a picture of the book or a screenshot of the first page. So make sure you tag both of us. Click the link in the description and start reading today. I view this video in a lot of ways as the flip side to my five countries that will collapse for 2040. The common thesis is that a global disorder is coming and some countries are going to lose in it and others will make massive gains. This is a list of those countries. The countries that will be able to ride the wave to be able to carve out important status in the world to come. There's a lot of really important factors going into this, which I cover in other videos in this geopolitics series like why is the world crazy and wars of the 2020s and 30s, but a big factor here is that the U.S. is entering an isolationist phase, and I've explained it in these other geopolitical videos I've been doing, but the heart of the matter is that economic, geopolitical, and demographic factors all converge to make the U.S. stop caring about the world outside of the first world in the Americas. Both the Republicans and Democrats have isolationist agendas for the future. I don't see the U.S. completely abandoning Europe, and the U.S. will continue to fight China, but not a lot of effort will go into the Middle East, now that the U.S. is oil independent and Africa as well. The U.S.'s umbrella's influence is way more than most of us think. The U.S. military system supported the entire post-World War II civilization, which involved protecting the entire world's shipping and protecting weaker countries from foreign conquest. This opened up a golden age of international peace and economic cooperation. This whole system's about to end. This, alongside a couple other factors we're going to talk about as we move through this video, will allow certain countries to become dominant international players. These countries are listed here from what I think the least to most likely options are for them to become great powers in the next 60 years. Number 6. The East African Federation This is a weird one. It's one of those low-chance empires that I put little stock in their long-term success, but has like a 1 in 10 or so shot of becoming a major power. First of all, I find the sheer possibility of this country's existence somewhat bizarre and unrealistic, but as of now, it's going to occur. 
The countries of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan are supposed to unify to form a single mega country in 2023 with Arusha and Tanzania as its capital. If this were to occur, it would be the biggest border shift since the end of the Soviet Union. The country would have a population of 190 million, making it the eighth most populous country in the world. I'm going to start the things that I think make this unlikely, and then move on to the things that mean that if it were to occur, the potential could be enormous. The big thing holding this back is that the general force of entropy of uniting six nations. Elites everywhere, and especially in Africa, don't like giving up power. Big grandiose schemes have a tendency to fail in Africa due to corruption and parochialism. However, the East African Union would have a couple of advantages, one major one being that none of the national identities are strongly formed. For example, the issue with forming a United States of Europe would be that the French, German, or Spanish identities have existed and been fortified by a thousand years of history. With the possible exceptions of Uganda and Rwanda, both of which were sort of proto-states controlling them beforehand, all the nations here were artificially created by Europeans. This means they can be superseded without much pain. A major issue most African nations have is that the tribe has remained a far more powerful organism than the state. This means that in most African countries, the nations became dominated by a single tribe which oppresses the others. I find the ideological civil wars of the Cold War in Africa amusing since both sides were really just tribes and just pretending to care about communism or democracy in order to get foreign weapons. However, if you build a large enough empire, the tribal identities become small enough that no one tribe can maintain dominance. If you look at history, most tribal identities have been broken down by multi-ethnic empires, whether the Romans, Han, Chinese, Arabs, etc. Every civilization has to develop certain cultural mechanisms to maintain large societies beyond the tribal level. Most of this area only has a heritage of the state going back a hundred years. Tanzania and Rwanda are both in the top of Africa for economic fairness and freedom, and so if they could transpose their institutions in the rest of the East African Union, we'd be in a really good place. A couple of the Federation members are the fastest growing economies on Earth, although when economies start out pretty small, that's not as impressive as it sounds. I'm generally optimistic about Africa's ability to form an empire once the UN American system stops making the nation sacred. Modern Africa makes sense on either a tribal level or the imperial system mentioned above. Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't really have a strong imperial tradition. With 50 nations, once the international systems leaves, I see Africa becoming a laboratory of nation building. With 50 nations with such cultural diversity, what are the chances one spawns a Harun al-Rashid, Charlemagne, or Augustus? It might not be the East African Federation, but I think they're the most likely choice of anyone now. The normal progression of history is that empires form around the edges of the previously developed world. Almost every state formed this way, as some warlord in the edges of a developed society united a people together, importing the techniques of the more developed neighboring society. If you let states wage war with each other, the strongest will survive, and they'll adopt technology from the world around them. In a Hobbesian world without America, this process will happen somewhere in Africa. An important factor is that modern technology is finally overcoming tropical Africa's geographic barriers. In 1950, large parts of Tanzania were uninhabitable for any human since disease was so terrible. Since then, Africa has seen a five times growth in agricultural productivity. Malaria and sleeping sickness prevented big cities from developing in much of tropical Africa, but we now have the capability to eradicate both illnesses on a national basis. Africa's lack of navigable rivers or draft animals, which was crippling in pre-industrial times, can now be broken by the railroad or highway. Geographically, the East African Federation has a few advantages. The highlands in Kenya or Tanzania are temperate, they have South Sudan's oil and a coastline. They don't have any really dangerous neighbors either, excepting possibly Ethiopia in a couple decades. Once an empire would develop in Africa, it could become a preeminent international force. With the stability formed by an empire, the whole rest of Africa would use it as their economic center and neighboring countries would come under their influence in exchange for protection. In an era of more international chaos in which daddy America isn't around, that would be valuable. Lots of people like to mock Africa for how poor it is. I find this foolish. We have to remember that most of East Africa 120 years ago was an Iron Age illiterate society, roughly as developed as Britain was for the Roman conquest. Under these circumstances, Africa's development has been downright extraordinary. However, I don't predict a clean future for the continent. Global warming making the continent drier and Malthusian pressures both mean Africa will have a huge crisis at some point in the 21st century. But by the end of the century, I predict there will be an African empire, and I think it's most likely to be the East African Federation.
Number 5, Iran. Iran has always been a major power. If you accept the 20th and late 19th centuries, there really hasn't been a time since Socrates that Iran wasn't in the top 10 nor more commonly 5 most powerful countries on the planet. This has given the Iranians remarkable diplomatic skills. Ever since the time of Cyrus the Great, the Iranians have been able to wield diplomacy like a sword offensively, splitting up their opponents before their opponents can attack them. A big reason for Iran's success is that it's in the mountains, which means it's able to maintain its independence pretty well across history. Also, the mountains have meant that Iran's never been pacified, meaning the Iranians have always been pretty good fighters. The big issue with countries like Iraq, Syria, and Egypt is that their native populations live in the valleys and have become so downtrodden by millennia of foreign oppression that they don't really make a coherent military force very well. I like to think of the last 40 years of Iranian foreign policy as what would happen if a really good strategy player was able to play a country in a video game like Europa Universalis or Civilization. Iran is one of the very few majority Shia countries in the world, and they've been able to gain the defender of the Shia card to play influence all over the world wherever there are Shia minorities. As of now, the Iranians have large influence in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Lebanon, and Syria, or most of the Middle East. For a weak country, this has been downright remarkable. The big weakness to this was that Iran's internal policy has been downright awful. Iran has been in a profound economic recession with unemployment at 14%. A good deal of this has been due to the US embargo, another part is in mismanagement in the part of the Islamic mullahs. This is where the crux of Iran's potential as a superpower lies. I think Iran as a nation has immense potential as a superpower, I just don't trust the mullahs to do it properly. They have a very well-educated population and are around half industrialized, which puts them above their whole region. The Middle East is also a region the U.S. is pulling out of for a variety of reasons. Partially since the U.S. is now oil independent and also after 9-11, the U.S. is just sick of the area. The Middle East has always been controlled by big empires and those empires were most commonly Iranian. If Iran were to somehow leave the autocratic and restrictive mullahs, they could fully industrialize with their well-educated population and dominate the region. Of Iran's neighbors, Saudi Arabia won't last very long, something I talk about in this video, and Iraq and Syria are also failed states. Their only real threat to the west is Turkey. In the east, the picture also looks pretty good. Afghanistan is also a failed state. I don't see Pakistan surviving very long, meanwhile, due to Malthusian pressures, lack of a coherent national identity, being stuck in the center of the map with neighbors that hate it, while having terrible defensive geography and generally not being a functioning nation. Similarly, Central Asia is in a terrible position in the next few decades due to overpopulation, climate change, and corrupt governments. This means that the Iranians are the default leaders of a world around them that's falling apart. Number 4. Ethiopia So, most of Sub-Saharan Africa has basically no history of centralized states where the Europeans showed up in 1900. Ethiopia is a major exception to this. Ethiopia has been a developed, centralized, unified nation since around 500 BC, give or take a few centuries. Ethiopia was one of the more powerful nations in the world in the centuries before Muhammad. Today, Ethiopia stands in an advantageous position in its entire region for a variety of reasons, one of which is geographic. Ethiopia's mountains mean that even though it's pretty close to the equator, it has a Mediterranean climate like Greece's or Egypt's. Similarly, unlike anyone else for a very long distance, Ethiopia is in the process of industrialization. The stereotype of the starving Ethiopian is no longer true, as Ethiopia has seen one of the highest indexes of economic growth of anyone in the world in the last decade. The Ethiopians are also damming up the Nile, which, if successful, gives them life-or-death power over the downriver nations such as Egypt. Ethiopia's mountainous terrain also makes it difficult to conquer, and the people are tough fighters. With the possible exception of the East African Union, there is no one in this area who would really be capable of countering Ethiopia. Somalia and South Sudan are effectively failed states. Sudan's an Ethiopian ally. The Horn of Africa is actually a part of the world where the U.S. would be happy to have a local power show up. It would allow someone to clamp down on the Somalian pirates and the excesses of the Yemeni and South Sudanese civil wars. Ethiopia, although a landlocked nation, has already started the formation of a navy based out of Djibouti to help police the Arabian and Red Seas. The Ethiopians have generally been using Djibouti as their de facto coastline since Somalia is a failed state and Eritrea really hates them. A major factor holding Ethiopia back is their internal ethnic tensions. Although the country of Ethiopia has existed for a long time, it hasn't been able to supersede the tribes very well. These tribal conflicts sparked the Ethiopian civil war as the Tigray rebelled. 
Modern technologies like trains and highways are making stitching together mountainous Ethiopia's various ethnic groups into a single nation easier. However, civil wars tend to presage greater later unity. This is since one faction of the elite can murder the other and rule the nation without any argument. This is how the American, Russian, or British civil wars presaged eras of expansion. If Ethiopia can keep its unity, they'll likely become a local power. Whether they expand to become an extra local power depends on how they play their cards. Number 3. India India is a weird country when it comes to their geopolitical future. It has some pretty strong advantages, but it's also got some pretty strong weaknesses. A pretty big factor is that, in my opinion, throughout history, India has been remarkably unaggressive. The Gangetic Plain has more often than not been controlled by foreign dynasties, and an Indian army has only ever attacked outwards from the subcontinent once, that being in the High Middle Ages when the South Indian Cholas sent a fleet to Indonesia. India has a terrible military record, and it's hard to tell exactly because records before 1000 AD are so terrible, but they've lost far more wars than they've won. This has been a constant across Indian history, although I've heard that the leadership in the Indian army today is pretty good. They've also never been able to maintain a coherent, diplomatic, aggressive foreign policy. This is how China has surrounded India with Chinese allies and bases in the modern world. If I was in the Indian government, I would have hanged the people that let the Chinese set up ports in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. In general, a big factor holding India back is China. China is a far more powerful, wealthy, and organized nation. You can look at all the statistics you want, but I think the most telling thing is just looking at a street view of either country. China is currently damming up India's water supply with the sources of rivers like the Brahmaputra, Ganges, and Indus. If they can succeed at this, India will become a Chinese puppet. The U.S. is India's ally, and a lot of India's fate depends on how China turns out. If China ends up becoming victorious in a conflict to come, India becomes a puppet. If China implodes or if China is driven back by an anti-Chinese coalition involving India, the Indians would end up becoming de facto hegemons of the Indian Ocean region. India's geographic position means it could easily be a kick-ass naval power. It juts into the middle of the Indian Ocean like a giant triangle, and based off oceanic monsoonal patterns, is in a really good place. This has surprisingly only really been taken advantage of once in Indian history, by the Cholas. However, if India was capable of pulling through, it could become a naval hegemon of a massive area stretching from East Africa to Indonesia. The Americans wouldn't do anything to stop this because, firstly, this is a part of the world the U.S. no longer really cares about, and also, India is a democratic nation and a trusted ally. India economically and societally is sort of a mixed bag. I'm just going to say I don't understand India, and so take my impressions with a heavy grain of salt. The impression I've gotten is that India is industrializing, but it's a much less clean process than it was with the East Asian tiger economies. Economic and social growth does occur, but it's often uneven and haphazard. India is a country with some extremely developed high-tech sectors, but also a good part of the population living in the Iron Age and has millions of slaves. It's sort of like Tsarist Russia before World War I, where you're not really sure what level of development to peg it at. Similarly, it's difficult to really figure out its level of national consciousness. India as a unified country is only 80 years old. Beforehand, there was a concept of India, but it was more like the cultural or religious concept of, say, Christendom in the Middle Ages. In case of a conflict, I'm not sure how patriotic the average peasant who will be carrying a gun will be. Will he care about anything that goes on outside of his village? This all boils down to a very blunt point. I have no idea if India has a coherent enough society to be a superpower. If India can cohere, its sheer size gives it a strong advantage in the world south of the Himalayas. Similarly, India has a large growing young population, which is a strong advantage going forward, especially against China's insane aging that'll be coming soon. India's neighbors could turn out to be pretty good as long as India can exert economic influence outwards. Bangladesh is part of the Gangetic Plain, and so should theoretically be sucked into a wealthier India's economic orbit. Sri Lanka is in a similar position. Burma is a large rice exporter and could thus sell to India's 1 billion plus people, creating a strong relationship. As said before, Pakistan is in such a terrible position that if India survives, it will likely be sucked into India's orbit by the end of the century. Indian nationalism is heavily Hindu-based now, but that's been an aberration in Indian history. Perhaps once India becomes wealthier, they'll return to a civilizational and cultural base of Indian identity, one that would include Pakistan rather than a religious one that excludes it. Number 2. France This might surprise you, and it's something you might not already know, but France is already somewhat of a world power. France maintained real control over much of their former colonial empire in Africa. 
They control West Africa's currencies, keep tight leashes on the local government, and militarily intervene when they want to. France is currently fighting four wars in Africa to keep the jihadis from taking over the Sahel. Similarly, France is also involved in Libya. As the U.S. pulls out of the world, I don't see it's likely that the U.S. pulls out of Europe in any real way. Partially this is since as long as the U.S. remains a majority white nation, which contrary to popular belief will not happen anytime soon, the Americans will not let their European kin be left to the wolves. Another reason is that a big thing that pisses off the Americans at dealing with the rest of the world is that it isn't inside their self-interest. The Europeans, however, controlling one quarter of the world's economy are wealthy enough to make it in America's self-interest to stay. I see three scenarios for the US and Europe, and I'll cover this in detail in a later video. The most likely of which, in my opinion, is that the Europeans start giving the US what amounts to tribute payments in exchange for protection. The second is that the Europeans start providing for their own defenses while maintaining an alliance with the Americans. And the third and most unlikely is that the US just leaves the Europeans to fend for themselves. France is the least pacified of the Western European nations. Britain is in the Americans' pockets for cultural reasons, and as long as the older generation stays in power in Germany, they're not militarizing. Meanwhile, Germany's birth rate means that the younger generation will be running into Japan-like aging issues. France is also the most independent of America of the Western European nations, having pulled out of NATO and keeping a foreign policy independent of the United States. Is. France also is one of the healthiest and most stable demographic structures of any European nation. A big factor here is the US sees no reason to protect its allies' oil supply anymore. For Europe, this is somewhat disastrous, since their oil either comes from the unstable Middle East or from Russia, which has massive strings attached. America also really doesn't have a strong self-interest to care at the Mediterranean, since most of the countries it cares about are on the Atlantic. Both of these positions open up opportunities for France, who will likely become the Mediterranean's policemen, turning Spain and Italy into allies. This will be popular with the French who will want more power, and the Americans who will have less responsibility. In this video, I predict Egypt will collapse in the near future due to demographic and climactic reasons. If that happens, someone needs to keep the Suez Canal open, and France is as good a guess as anyone. France could also supply Europe's oil by spreading influence in North and West Africa, as well as sitting on the Suez, thus getting oil from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. I could see the French splitting the unhappy, coastal, oil-rich Igbo minority off as an independent country in Nigeria, adding it to their West African influence. A big factor here is that America and France will make great partners. Both countries hold the same values and belong to the same civilizations. For all their bickering, both countries like each other. Americans would be happy to leave the things outside of their self-interest to the French. Number 1. Turkey. This one has sort of become a meme. I often get mocked as a Turkophile partially due to my love of the Ottoman Empire, but also because I keep saying Turkey is about to become a superpower. Just hear me out on this one, guys. The Turks have a lot of advantages, the main one of which is that they're much better off than literally everyone else in their area. They have an industrialized economy, booming young population, coherent imperial ideology, that of Turkish nationalism and Islam, and a powerful military. Meanwhile, they sit in a neighborhood of weaklings. The Balkan countries have struggling, corrupt economies and some of the oldest and actively declining populations in the world. These countries aren't going anywhere, and their geography naturally predisposes them towards the Black Sea and Istanbul. The U.S. won't care as long as it can keep a defensible border for the westernized parts of Central Europe, one which they can maintain at the mountain pass at Belgrade. Russia's declining population, weak economy, and lack of a coherent national will puts them in a very similar location. Georgia and Armenia are also in similar positions to that as well. The Turks could easily control the entire Black Sea region by claiming control of Crimea. The Turks could use Turkic ethnic minorities to support their control, whether they be the Azeris in Iran or the Chechnyans or Tatars in Russia, who gain more and more power inside Russia by the year due to their higher birth rates. Chechnya is already practically self-governing, and so I could see them getting a better deal from the Turks and just leaving the Russians. In the south, the Turks are damming up Iraq's water supply, a country nearly entirely dependent upon the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, thus effectively giving them control over the country. Syria is a failed state that they could conquer fairly easily. As I talked about in the previous video, I think Saudi Arabia and Egypt are on the verge of collapse, and these societies' flat terrain, disaffected populations, and bad militaries would make these countries pretty easy conquests.
The Americans and other great powers would generally be okay with this, since in general the Turks are preferable alternatives to all the other regimes in the area, with the exception of groups like the Armenians and Bulgarians. The US will want stability in the region and the Turks, followed by the Iranians, are the only people that can really achieve that. Similarly, given the global disorder ahead that I've often talked about, the US likely have bigger things to care about. A big issue with Turkey's rise is their current leadership, which has brought them into a tremendous amount of debt. Similarly, Erdogan's bellicose saber-rattling has had the effect of pissing off the West and Russia. However, their important strategic position means they can probably get a bailout from one of the major powers, most likely China. Similarly, the Turks have poured their debt into real assets like infrastructure that they can keep even if they file for bankruptcy. The Turks could make a surprisingly coherent empire for a couple reasons. The first of which being that loyalty in the Islamic world is V-shaped, in that local tribal identities are really strong, as are the transnational broad Islamic identities. The Turks have the capability of becoming leaders of the Sunni world, as they were under the Ottomans, creating a unifying identity based around the Sunni identity. This would be an opposition to the Turkish nationalism that's dominant today and came in under Ataturk. Similarly, with control of this region, they'd be able to control a massive amount of the world's oil, which would make them a major power in of itself. We've also seen cycles of industrialization across history. In the first wave, one's level of industrialization was determined by how culturally close to Britain one was. In the second, Japan. Now that we've seen Turkey industrialize, we'll likely see a wave of industrialization among the subject Arab peoples. The Arabs are also a young, booming population, and thus a good captive market for Turkish industry. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned to additional content. Or alternatively, check me out on Patreon like these wonderful patrons. On there, I've got maps, the first 11 chapters of my history of the world, as well as the first three chapters of my cultural history of America, as well as exclusive fan-only video content where you can ask me all sorts of what-if questions. Or alternatively, check out my merchandise, where I've got all sorts of maps, mugs, and t-shirts with this show's branding. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.